Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Steve Barnes. In this episode, we'll be looking at the psychology of consumer contract formation. That is, the extent to which a consumer's sense of moral obligation can predict whether or not they'll adhere to or breach a contract. We're fortunate to be joined today by Tess Wilkinson Ryan. She's a professor of law and psychology here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Thanks so much for joining us. So if you could please talk a little bit about your overall approach to researching the psychology of consumer contracts and related decision making. Great. Um, I am an experimental psychologist by training, and my particular um, interest is in moral psychology. So how people conceive of their moral obligations or their ethical obligations, um, and in my case, particular, it's particularly about um, how those informal norms and commitments converge with or diverge from their legal obligations. Right. So how people sort of morally approach how they enter into a contract, basically. In my case, yes. So in particular, I mean, I'm sort of, sort of funneled down, right? So I'm interested in moral psychology of legal decision making, in particular about uh, contract choices. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I draw on the methodological tools of experimental psychology mm -hmm. to ask questions about uh, how people think about contracts. So how people think about when they should breach a contract, what kind of contracts they should enter, um, how to interpret the terms of their contracts, um, and maybe even the role of contracts in their larger sort of social and commercial lives. Right. So when you say contracts, what kind of contract do you mean? Is it just a whole range of contracts? Is it paper contracts, online contracts? What are we looking at? In some ways, that's one of the questions that I'm trying to ask is, is which sort of the different sort of meaning of different kinds of contracts. L lately, my interest is primarily in consumer contracts. So the kinds of contracts that we all sign without reading, typically, okay. right? So when you click, I agree to terms and conditions, when you buy a product on Amazon, or when you submit a payment via PayPal, or when you join a gym, I mean, the right. sort of the list sort of goes on and on. Mm -hmm. um, and at the, so lately, I've been particularly interested in these kinds of low stakes contracts that we all participate in every day. That said, a lot of the um, implications or um, sort of relationships between morality and law have um, uh, have purchase in other areas of contracting. So, so for example, mortgage contracts, right, are, a, um, are something that I have been interested in in the past. Or even, um, and, and, and actually for a long time I've been thinking about just person-to-person -person individual contracts. So contracts between um, a homeowner and a contractor, right, They're getting um, contracts between um, an individual who hires someone to um, for a snow to, to snow plow over ever, over the winter, that kind of thing, right? This sort of um, the kinds of arm's length contracting that we might do with someone who we sort of know but have a commercial relationship with. Right. So just to step back a bit, um, how does your training in psychology inform your work? Because again, you are a professor in a law school, and you're yeah. teaching at least the psychological aspects of law to your students. Yeah. In in some respect. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm oftentimes teaching just plain contract doctrine, right, when right. I teach the first year uh, course. But so just to, to sort of back up, I would, um, as a general matter, I take the position, which is not new to me, that we ought to know something about the human subjects that the legal system purports to regulate, right? So, um, and it, right, so I think assumptions about what humans are like, right? ideas about what humans are like, undergird most legal systems. I mean, this is not new to psychology, right? So if you think, so, so uh, Machiavelli thought you should design a government that was based on um, what laws would work best if all men were knaves, right? if, all, if all people were sort of wicked. Mm -hmm. You design the system assuming that, and then you hope it works for everybody, something like that, right? In the, in the modern incarnation of that, you might see sort of a law and economics approach that says, if people are all rational utility maximizers, right? If people are all rational and they, and they want to uh, maximize their own either wealth or maybe more generally utility, um, let's go with the kind of legal system that's going to be best for those humans, essentially, right? Okay, 
So psychologists, are, I think, are in good company in, our, in the interest in human behavior. It's just that the approach is empirical, right? So we're asking, not, we're not asking what legal system works assuming a set of um, characteristics of humans. We're asking what characteristics of humans are. So in the contracts context, I'm asking, I want to know how individuals um, uh, understand their obligations to one another when they have been formalized by contract, right? Um, with the goal of understanding or, or maybe even predicting how contract law affects our society, affects, um, that affects sort of people's beliefs, affects informal norms of how we uh, interact with one another, and then how that matters for the um, social order as a whole. The hope is that this line of research helps us predict sort of which deals people will choose, when they'll leave those deals, how they're going to figure out the problems that, they, that might come up, when they're going to pursue litigation, right? all these things that matter for the legal system and matter for how we think about what contract law ought to be doing. So to bring up some specific examples, you completed a study recently where you noted that the parties to a contract approach each other differently before a contract is formed versus how they do uh, once it's finalized. So overarchingly, what was the study about? And why do people behave that way? Um, in other words, what are the dynamics they're in as part of this behavior? OK, yeah, great. So um, this study was co-authored with my um, with my colleague David Hoffman. Um, and the study came from the following sort of common sense intuition, something along the following lines. Um, imagine that you sign up for a credit card, and you do all your research about which credit card is the best, and um, you choose one. And then uh, later on, you get one of those sort of bill stuffers that tells you some, some term of your deal has changed. Our general sense was you don't then update your set of preferences about credit cards. You ignore the bill stuffer. You are, you've, made your, you've made your deal, right? You're not going to go back and revisit it. Um, and so the question was, well, why is that the case? There's lots of explanations. Well, first of all, are we right? And second of all, there's lots of explanations for why that could be. And is there, is there any um, reason to think that some of the explanations are essentially psychological rather than economic? Right? So, there's, so sort of economic explanations would be something along the lines of, well, at this point, you've developed a relationship with this credit card company. Or you know, if you're going to um, apply again for a new credit card, it's going to mess with your credit score. Right? There's, there's actual cost to switching at that point. Um, psychological explanations would be something more along the following. Um, once you've made a decision, you, don't wanna, you just don't want to think about it anymore. Um, Part of our explanation had to do with um, uh, some of the insights from prospect theory, which is, a, which is a theory that basically says that once you have moved into a place where the contract is the status quo, deviating from that implicates this sort of status quo bias or default bias that you see in this prospect theory context. OK, so most of these studies we do via vignette, via um, asking people to read a, a story about a contract, and then just to tell us their, and we ask them a bunch of follow-up questions. Do you th what do you think about this? How do you, you know, do you think it's wrong to break this contract? What, what would you do? Would you say, OK. Um, so the story was more or less as follows. Um, so you are leasing a car, and you have um, identified uh, a, a, a price and a location that seem really good. Subjects were subjects. The people taking the participants, um, the participants were randomly assigned to see one of two versions of this scenario. In one version, they read, um, "This state has a um, three-day waiting period," and what this means is that you can take the car home right away, but you won't be, but you can return it within three days if you decide you don't want to keep the car for any reason. No, no hassle. No reason has to be given. All right, so we call this the contract uh, condition. The other half of the subjects were assigned to this condition that we called the no contract condition. It was a little bit more complicated, but the, but the gist was as follows. Everything else is the same. Your state has a three-day waiting period. And we said what this means is that um, your contract doesn't go into effect for three days. If you keep the car, the contract time period starts. If you don't keep the car, there's no contract. So either you can, so that we just said the difference between two conditions is either you can cancel your contract, 
or your contract in three days or your contract doesn't start for three days. Everything else is the same. You still drive away with the car. You still have to bring the car back to, to get out of the deal. Okay. The question then was, um, if you saw an ad that said similar car for $15 cheaper per month, would you pursue the other deal and bring back the car you've got? It turned out that which condition people were in made a difference, even though our feeling was there's no practical difference between these two things. And the way it cut was that the people who thought that they were in a contract that they could cancel basically were more reluctant to switch out. People who, thought, who viewed their position as being technically not in a contract were more willing to take this other deal. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the idea was the mere sort of formal fact of, of being in a contract affected people's, affected the participants' um, Willingness to protect their own self-interest is one way of thinking about it, right? Willingness to save themselves money, um, even when there were no actual legal consequences to opting out of the deal. Okay, that makes sense. So do you have a sense then of what the motivations of the people who are in the contracts felt? Yeah, that, so we've been trying um, to tease that out more or less ever since this paper on, um, on this idea of the difference between being in and out of contract. At least one of the explanations seems to be a sort of increasing, an increased sense of moral obligation once people are in a contract. Um, and this we have been playing with in a couple of different ways. So um, one is just to think about the ways that people enter contracts as being along a spectrum rather than, or a continuum, I guess, rather than have been sort of an on-off switch. So contract doctrine, at least American contract doctrine partic uh, particularly, usually conceives of just one moment in time in which you're just, you know, so, so you're just pre-contract and now you're post-contract. And doctrinally, that's certainly the case, right? There's, we can identify the moment of contract formation typically, um, and we have very different rules for how the parties are obligated to one another pre and post, right? Um, but our, um, but at least, uh, it, at least in one sort of follow-up study to this, um, to the paper I've just described, um, we asked people about their, moral intuitions about contracts in the particular cases um, in which they were sort of steps along the path to contracting. And there's even steps one takes after contracting. So, you know, just knowing that someone has made an offer and is hoping to hear that you've accepted it, does that, um, does that provide some moral motivation? And the answer was, I think, yes. Um, what about knowing that it's been accepted and the parties think that there's a deal, even if even in the cases in which, the, for some reason, that doesn't have legal implications, right, because there's a waiting period or something? What about knowing that one of the parties has relied on this deal in some ways and, and, and invested in the contract in some way that's, um, that uh, increases the benefit of the deal to the other party, which is to say, what about goodwill, right? What about what if there's some sort of reciprocal goodwill? Then do the parties feel more bound? Um, and the answer was, I mean, as, as what you can imagine, the answer was yes. Um, and I think that this probably speaks to some real world phenomena that have to do with how parties engage in um, transactions, especially when they um, have reason to feel that they ha that they owe some kind of courtesy or reciprocity <coughs> to the other party. Okay, great. Um, so you talked about moral obligation and people perhaps being less, inclin less inclined to breach contract. So um, one of your other recent articles or studies is provocatively titled "Breach is for Suckers." So. What did that research entail? And importantly, because we work in an academic institution, how do you define sucker? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, when I was in graduate school, I got very interested in the idea of, um, of how, this is sort of a more general, even outside of legal decision making, but how uh, people might, um, or how, how humans um, try to avoid feeling like they are suckers, 
how do you avoid feeling like you have been duped or exploited? Because it's a wildly aversive feeling, right? Feeling like you're on the, on the, um, on the wrong side of a deal. Oftentimes the way that that plays out is that one party feels that they have followed the rules while the other party has not. And so you sort of feel stupid for having um, towed the line when others around you have uh, sort of cut corners or exploited loopholes or whatever. Um, so in this, uh, in this sucker paper, we were particularly interested in um, the idea that maybe this is what causes people to feel like breach of contract is so wrong. So one of so in my um, in my uh, in my graduate work that was particularly contract specific, um, I had asked people a bunch of questions about how they viewed breach of contract. So, you know, what kind of um, legal money damages should be awarded in the event of a breach of contract? Um, uh, how morally wrong is it to breach a contract in the various contexts, et cetera. And people were surprisingly sort of punitive in their attitudes toward breach of contract. They thought, like, this is really bad. And indeed, um, some of the participants who were participating online and reading these pretty bland scenarios about, you know, a, a contractor who fails to, you know, refinish one's floors, right, would write these rather long screeds about how, you know, this is what's wrong with, um, America today, you can't trust anybody, this is terrible, et cetera. Which is to say, I had the sense that people were really invested in this issue. Um, so uh, my co-author, uh, David Hoffman, again for that paper, and I were thinking about what is the, what, what's going on here that people think breach of contract is so bad? Like, why don't they just take it as sort of this is all business, you just, you know, pay the damages, let's go our own way. Okay. Um, and our our idea, which came in part out of sort of asking, asking people, right, asking subjects about their intuitions, was that it feels like a betrayal. It feels like a, like a sort of disrespectful um, thing to do. To break a promise to someone who's expecting you to fulfill it is a way of, some people viewed it as sort of exploiting the, almost a technicality in the legal system at the cost of another person, at the cost of the promisee. Um, so that's why we, that's why we wrote about this sort of, um, this breaches for suckers was the idea that that's what's, that's the problem with breach is that it makes you feel like a sucker. I mean, there are various explanations I think that are, I don't think it's an ex the exclusive explanation. Uh, but the idea was to get at sort of what is the emotional harm, sort of, which is something that contract law explicitly doesn't compensate. So that's interesting when you compare that to, you know, folks who online, whether on Amazon, iTunes, whatever, click on the terms of agreement, probably not putting much thought into or perhaps much weight into what they're actually being contract contractually obligated for, right? Yeah. Um, so that turns out to be, I think, a more complicated um, connection than it would seem. So I think the intuitive, the intuitive um, sort of analysis or, or connection is, okay, fine. People might view their their contracts with other individuals, especially other sort of not people who are not otherwise like uh, in business, right? So, um, as um, as morally binding. But are you trying to tell me that they view themselves as morally bound to Apple because they clicked "I agree" on the terms and conditions? That's more or less the intuition, right? It's not actually clear to me that they don't. So. I would be totally willing to predict that they feel differently. In fact, I have some, there's some evidence to that um, effect, but they, the effect doesn't go away. And that's almost to me what's particularly problematic, which is to say, I mean, companies may be constrained by reputation effects, right? That may, that may constrain them from breach from, or, or, or um, disincentivize the, their breach of contracts, right? Or sort of, um, you know, burdensome interpretation of terms or whatever. But they may be benefiting from the fact that their customers view themselves as morally bound um, in, in ways that are, 
not uh, that the that the company wouldn't wouldn't reciprocate. Um, so some of this I looked at in the foreclosure context, um, because in so there was a there was a broader discussion in two thousand eight two thousand ten um, about whether when why uh, homeowners whose houses are underwater so people who owe more than they. Um, than the home is worth. Yes, that's my next question, as a matter of fact, about your mortgage okay. and foreclosure study. Yeah. yeah, so people, so when people owe more than the home is worth, what do they do? Mm -hmm. What should they do? What do they do? When do they do what they do, right? Um, and a straightforward sort of economic analysis says, if it is more profitable, if you save more money or make more money, I want to think about it, by walking away from your home and entering foreclosure, then you should do that, right? And um, and there was some question about whether or not people would do this, and there was also sort of a question about why some people weren't, right? And at the time, I, I assume this is still a going concern, but at the time, at least, there was a um, website called youwalkaway.com, and this website permitted you to go in, enter in your the value of your home, the amount on your mortgage, the place you lived, a couple other sort of basic facts about your housing situation. Uh, maybe a rent, maybe something information about the rental market you live in, and more or less would just use the algorithm and spit out like how much money you will save if you walk away. This is particularly salient in or or helpful in um, these in non-recourse states, so states where the where once you've entered foreclosure, the bank doesn't have any continuing um, right to go after your assets, right? Um, and there, you know, California, for example, is a non-recourse state, and that's where this was a big deal. Um, even in states that where there is so even in other states, um, in some cases, the costs of pursuing these borrowers were so high that it was unlikely that they were actually going to have to, um, that they were going to be pursued by the banks. Um, OK, so there was this question, what should people do? And the economic answer was relatively easy, even factoring in the hit to your credit. There was sort of a set of instructions you could follow, which is to say, go rent your apartment now, right? Get that going. So you know, get your other housing set up, and then you just take the hit to your credit. It lasts for like seven years or something, and you get out of the situation in which you're paying too much for your mortgage. And this is the, the analysis is really aimed at people who could keep paying or making a choice, right? It's a very different choice if you if one is paying enormous amounts and it also has, has you know become unemployed. That's a sort of a different situation. So this is called strategic default, which is to say you get to make a choice, a, a, a meaningful choice. Um, So around the time that this was happening, I had become interested in um, liquidated damages clauses in contracts. Liquidated damages clauses in contracts just are clauses that stipulate how much the breaching party will have to pay in the event of breach. That's, so it's relatively straightforward. And there was, um, and part of what I was finding, um, which is in line with some other research from different domains, was when you stipulate the damages amount in the contract, people are more willing to breach the contract. The idea being, if you know what the penalty is, um, and you have essentially incorporated the possibility of breach and payment into the deal itself, it doesn't feel as wrong and it's easier to get out. Feels like an escape clause, basically? Yeah, an escape clause, not just an escape clause, but also an escape clause that both parties have agreed on, right? So which is to say you've warned the other party, essentially, breach is a possibility. And you've both agreed on what the, on what the, um, uh, consequences of that are going to be. Okay. And so at this time, I started reading this. Um, there was like a, a blog on the New York Times in which somebody had written in and said, here's my situation. You know, I, have, I own this $500,000 house. It's currently worth $200,000. We're in one of these areas where, right, I owe $400,000 on it. What should I do? And the responses were really divided. So half the people were saying, well, here's how you do the math. You know, try youwalkaway.com, but basically don't forget to factor in your credit score. Think about the other options for housing, et cetera. And half the comments were nothing to do with the math. It was like, this is morally wrong. What are you doing? What, you, know, you made a commitment to your bank that you were going to repay this amount, and this is um, uh, a breach of that commitment. People are making, you know, sort of analogies to how this would, this sort of indicated the overall immorality of the individual thinking about this. Now, 
just to be clear, there are ways, this is, this is not a sort of efficient breach of contract situation, right? Because this does real harm to the bank when you, foreclosure in this context. Like it's, it does impose an actual loss on another party. But there was a real divergence in, the, in these comments that I was seeing um, where half the people were saying, look, you factored this into the deal. The bank priced the risk of lending to you, right? You've been paying for that, essentially, and they have established the penalty, which is foreclosure. When you hand over the keys, you are essentially exercising an option. And the other half saying, no, this was, this was a, the foreclosure is just uh, the punishment, sort of, for doing something that's morally wrong. Um, so my, um, question, I thought this was sort of fascinating because it sort of suggested this norm that's on a line, right? A case where we don't have a strong, or we, we, it's not that the individual didn't have a strong underlying view, but maybe as a society, we hadn't converged on a view of what, what you're supposed to do here, right? right? Uh, and that's very interesting for someone who's interested in moral psychology, um, because my idea was you have this sort of unstable norm and what kinds of factors could push parties over the line one way or the other. Interesting. Yeah, sure. So, I, so my studies in that case were about what happens if um, there are more or less people in your neighborhood who enter foreclosure. The idea being just if you're not sure what you're supposed to do here, if you're not sure what the norm is, maybe you look around and say, what's the norm, right? And you, just as a matter of sort of the descriptive norm, right, what people are actually doing, you, if there's more people entering foreclosure, you think, okay, maybe this is something that we're doing now, right? Um, similarly, what happens if, what happens, how might people be responding to the changing face of mortgage lending? So at mortgage lending, at least when, when say my parents were getting a mortgage, they went to the bank in our, town and talk to the lender sure. in particular, a person whose name they knew, right? And that's, and they originated the loan and held the loan at the local bank. Um, whereas that's in, in, increasingly, um, rare right now. It's more likely that you use a national bank and that they immediately assign the loan to somebody else. Um, and then of course, this was also all happening in the context of people saying like, look, a lot of these, a lot of this lending was crazy in the first place and the banks were getting bailed out. Um, by the government. So people had sort of depend, their sort of negative views about the banks, um, about the bank's practices would also sort of push people, right, to think that, wait a minute, maybe this is all meant, maybe we're supposed to be behaving as though this is not, there's no moral landscape to be attending to, right? Maybe what we're supposed to be doing is just thinking about this in terms of a pure, um, the, you know, purely on the numbers. Right. So, so how did the study, for lack of a better term, sort of shake out in terms of your studying where and how people cross that mm -hmm. sort of moral line between making a, you know, an informed um, and rational economic decision on the one hand or adhering to a moral obligation via this contract with the bank. Yeah. So the way that I was asking the question, maybe is something I skipped that I should have said. The way that I was asking the question was actually at what point do you walk away? So I would give them a scenario where their house was oh, it was worth $400,000, something like that. And then I would say, um, do you walk away if your house is now worth, three, it is, if you owe 400 and your house is now only worth 300? What about if it's worth 200? What if that's worth, does that make sense? I went down the ladder essentially. And there seemed to be a sort of focal point just gen overall at the 50% mark. Like once people's ha homes were worth less than, once they're, this, remember this is all hypothetical, right? Sure. Once the, once the scenario posited the value of the home at less than 50%, most people sort of switched into, yeah, now you, gotta, now you have to walk away. But so what I was trying to do was to see the, what little things might push that around a little bit. So, in, so what I would do is randomly assign subjects to the same, same basic scenario. You know, you live in a non-recourse state. I explained what non-recourse state does. Um, you know, you owe $400,000 on your home. You're able to keep paying it. You could, I give them some information about how much it would cost to rent an apartment, something like that. Um, and then I would ask them to choose at which level they, they, def they default, do they walk away. Um, but I'd randomly assign them, for example, to a scenario in which, you know, Acme Bank is local or Acme Bank is national. That's all. 
And basically you just see that you push sort of 10% of them around, right? So that 10% of them are, will, will move, I mean, I'm making up the numbers here, but you know, that 70% will walk away um, in the national bank situation once you get to the 50% mark and only 50 or 60 when, um, at the 50% mark in the um, local bank situation. Um, and I did something similar with, um, with sort of how people, with, with, you know, the percentage of people in your neighborhood um, who are, who, who have also defaulted. Right. So are you, are you at a point yet where you could say with some confidence that there is a predictive element in terms of consumer behavior for contracts? Um, that's certainly the goal. Um, I mean, so one of the, the strengths of psychology or of, sorry, the strength of experimental psychology in particular is, is the ability to isolate the causal mechanism, right? So the, so we observe all kinds of connections every day. Um, for example, the fact that people live that, that, that foreclosures seem to cluster in certain areas. There are tons of explanations for why that might be true, right? For example, they might be clustering in areas where um, there's been recent unemployment, right? That's, that has nothing to do with anything psychological, right? It just has to do with the, the sort of the way that fortunes rise and fall within particular geographic areas. Okay, so the, the strength of experimental psychology um, is the ability to home to, to home in on the particular causal explanation that you're positing and make sure that's the only different thing between two sort of randomly assigned conditions, right? So unfortunately, um, as you can imagine, I cannot assign um, underwater mortgagees to live in high or low um, foreclosure areas, right? In fact, I can't even typically, um, without sort of, sort of um, increased access to, to field research, which is, which is the sort of ultimately the goal, but typically um, I can't do any random assigning of real world contracts. I can't even assign people to have contracts with and without liquidated damages clauses, right? Um, so the downside is that I'm asking people things in the hypothetical, right? So we're trying to, so I'm trying to figure out um, if the particular little teeny detail that I've changed in the story is going to cause the behavioral response that I think it's going to cause. And in fact, I find that, right? right. What, how well that generalizes yeah. to, real, to human behavior, I don't, it's, it's hard to know, right? right? Ideally, what you're trying to do is a sort of um, uh, set out a hypothesis and then collect the, and then Sort of collect evidence from various domains, like operationalize the the prediction in different ways, and see how to the, the extent to which you have sort of convergent evidence. All right. So that that's really fascinating to know. Um, you've also done some research into the boilerplate of a contract or the fine print. I'm curious to know what did you discover there? Like, what did the study entail, and what did you find? Um. Okay. So, I. So my interest turns out not to be in fine print per se, which is to say that there are, there's really nice research out there about what's contained in all this fine print that we don't read. Right. I am interested in what are the implications of non-readership? What does it mean to be party to all these contracts that we don't read? And how does it change people's intuitions about their obligations, um, et cetera? So one of the, I think, sort of surprising I had this informal sense going into sort of starting a study of, of boilerplate that, that individuals who I'll sort of interchangeably call consumers, it's not a perfect fit, but, um, but that consumers themselves hold one another to a very high standard, um, which is to say there's sort of a caveat emptor view, right? You should have buyer beware. You shouldn't sign it if you didn't, if you didn't um, want to be held to it which is odd because we all know that no one's reading this stuff. Like, you couldn't possibly be reading all of your contracts. If we were all reading all of our contracts, we wouldn't be able to hold down jobs. That's the level of, that's the amount of words that we are asked to agree to every day. 
So my interest, um, and this is and this is sort of an ongoing set of projects, is in um, how um, how individuals think about this lack of readership and how it affects their perceptions of sort of who's to blame for transactional harms. Transactional harms is sort of a weird, a clunky way of thinking about it, but the idea would be um, the annoying stuff that comes out of your contracts that you didn't realize were there. Fee, a fee that you didn't notice. Um, maybe an arbitration clause, although even that one is, doesn't come up very much, right? Maybe something that your insurance doesn't cover that you sort of assumed that it would cover. That kind of stuff, like little stuff that your contract turns out, right? Turns out the return period was really short, and you had no, and you didn't know that, something like that. Um, so, so one of the studies that just that sort of spurred this whole paper was that I asked people, I just I just asked people randomly assigned people to read two different very short stories or whatever about a contract. One was that someone has a two-page credit card contract, and one was that someone has a fifteen-page credit card contract. And then basically the idea was that the, after they sign it and they, they start working with this credit card company, it turns out that there's an annoying fee for paying online. Okay. So it's not horrible. The stakes aren't super high, but they don't want to pay it, and they didn't know that this fee existed. Okay, so I started just by asking each group. Remember that they don't, each group has no reason to know that what I'm interested in is the length of the contract, right, because they're only seeing one or the other. And so I start by saying, how reasonable is it to expect this consumer to have read the whole contract? As you can imagine, people think it's pretty reasonable in the two-page context and very unreasonable in the 15-page context. There's a big difference. Sure. That seems right to me. Although I'm gonna go ahead and guess that most of us don't even read the two-page contract, but okay. Then I ask them, to what extent is this consumer to blame for his own misfortune, essentially? And there's no difference. Hmm. Interesting. So they don't think that, so they think you shouldn't have read but you're st it's still your fault. Right. I, not to take this as a personal example, but you know, to use the Amazon or I iTunes thing, and I'm not saying either of them do this, but let's just say I you know, buy some music or something, and yeah. I click, yeah, I agree to the terms or whatever, yeah. or I download their applications, whatever. Part of the clause is you know, I have to go mow the CEO's lawn, yes. right? right? I would assume as a consumer, well, that's ridiculous, and I could probably feasibly argue in court, but I'm not a lawyer, keep in mind, so I could be totally wrong in here. Like, who would ever uphold me to that? Perhaps yeah. legally, the courts would. But what is your view on that? No, pr you're pr probably you're good. That's probably an absurd example, but it strikes this. me that yeah. the average person would think, well, right. that just seems, as you say, unreasonably, utterly yeah. unreasonable. No, and that's, so, so with there you have sort of a convergence of two things, right? Which is that maybe it's unreasonable for you to expect you to read the contract, but the clause itself is so bizarre right. that it's unreasonable for the company to include it. Right. Because it's enormously but even burdensome. With a, even with like a, not a hidden fee, but a, a fee hidden in the fine print. That yeah. strikes me as very curious. You know, if you get a $5 charge, to use your example, to pay online, perhaps that is, as you say, I forget the word you used, but vexing, what was the word you used? Annoying. Annoying. It's, annoying. <laughs> it's an annoying fee. But right. it's, 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 what is what, sort of, what, yeah. is the, what is the litmus test for where annoying becomes, um, again, unreasonable? I mean, so we have a doctrine of unconscionability, right, which, is, which can come in and solve some of these problems. So there's a famous case, Williams versus Walker Thomas, um, in which uh, someone who was, um, has, was buying furniture on layaway, it turned out that, and, and buying all of her furniture on layaway. So she's furnishing a house over time with stuff on layaway. Does that make sense? So, sure. okay. It turned out, though, that there was a clause in the contract that said, basically, you pay for, um, uh, the money that you pay us every month is divided sort of pro rata among the different items you've ever bought, which functionally means you don't pay off anything until you've paid off everything. She defaulted on the you know 12th purchase and then had to and then they repossessed everything. Right? So she's actually paid them, surely she's paid them money to 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 pay almost all of the first 10 purchases, but she has to, but okay. And the court says, this is insane, right? This is both hidden in the contract and also is a, is a really burdensome uh, clause. 
the clauses that I'm most worried about are things that are not truly hidden in fine print. Hidden terms are indeed disfavored and, un and often unenforceable. If they're truly hidden, right? The print is really tiny or something like that. The problem is what's, what's hidden or not hidden in a 15 page contract? Or in, right. or in a dialogue box online, exactly. you have to scroll and scroll I mean, and scroll and it, scroll. It's not, if you look at it, if you look carefully at those contracts, it sure looks like the companies are trying to make it easy for you to find what you want in the sense that like stuff is all of a sudden will be in bold or in all caps, right? Um, right. So there's a, I think a plausible and, pro and probably a successful legal argument to be made that they're not hidden terms in that sense. This is just the term of the deal. And as long as it's something that's more or less sort of relevant or salient for that particular kind of transaction, so in banking fees, in insurance, what it covers would be something that we would expect you to like kind of figure out, right? Um, in warranties, right? What's, what's covered and what's not. Um, as long as it's the, is that kind of a thing where it's just, this is just the terms and conditions of the deal. This is your contract. It's all laid out for you here in this 11 page document. The argument is almost more that you can't possibly read all of these things. We know no one is reading them. And yet they're not hidden on a contract by contract basis, right? If this was the only thing you saw this month or this week, then it would be very easy for you to figure out what's in it. It's just that it's not worth your time to do, be doing that, to be doing that all so the time. So you're overwhelmed, the consumer is overwhelmed by volume and the culture is such that we're too busy and we don't want to pay attention? Is that sort of where I mean, it's really, I wouldn't even, I mean, I would say, look, do not read these contracts. That's not a good use of your time, mm -hmm. right? If you're reading every time you buy something on iTunes, like you could be spending your time in much better ways because you're very, very unlikely to have to sue Apple based on your, the song you downloaded. And they are very, very unlikely to sue you, right? I mean, the chances of there being a problem there right. are so low, not to mention the stakes are so low, right? The worst thing that happens, let's say that your, the song comes through and isn't what you hoped, like, well, if it was $1.29, right? right. Um, should you really have used your time, 15 minutes, sure. right, for it? Okay. Um, in some ways, my, cons my concern is the failure to appreciate the reality of this everyday contracting when we're thinking about who bears the burden for, for understanding, communicating contracts. Um, pri I mean, especially when we get into stuff like privacy policies, you know, I mean, who's ever reading those? But they have kind of wide ranging um, uh, social uh, consequences, not to mention personal consequences for the, for the users. So sort of interesting academically, but um, raises concerns. Um, sort of normatively, that firms and individuals are sort of exchanging boilerplate, exchanging words, exchanging text in, this, in, a, in a world in which they both understand that one of the parties isn't reading it, right? So you're going through the motions of communicating in a world in which no actual communication is, is, is happening and everyone knows no communication is happening when you're doing it. And it seems like, okay, fine, you know, if this is just some weird ritual that doesn't matter, let people do it, I guess. But my concern is that ex post, it does matter. Consumers think, that consumers think well, if I signed it, now I'm you know, morally obligated. Or if I signed it, then obviously it's enforceable, even in cases where, it really w where the term really wouldn't be enforceable, right? They right. Fail, to, fail to argue, right. fail to litigate, et cetera. So you talked about your concerns with the boilerplate or fine print aspects of forming contracts. Are there prescriptive elements to your work related to that or to contract formation more generally? Yeah, this is a particularly, um, this can often be a particularly sort of loaded question for people in my, um, uh, in my field, or maybe for, uh, for my work in particular. So I'll start with the sort of 11 disclaimers and then, and then talk a little bit about the actual question, which is to say, I'm typically pretty careful, um, and maybe careful in the sense of being 
conservative about how I think that these descriptive insights um, might yield prescriptive responses or prescriptive implications, in part because of the limitations of this kind of research, right? I sort of feel like this is at the very beginning of, of, a, of, some, of a trajectory or a line, and that I'm taking these little baby steps toward, um, toward feeling really comfortable that I know um, what this, what this um, set of the findings means and, and how robust it is, uh, et cetera. So I will admit to being generally quite, um, uh, quite conservative on the prescriptive front. With, with that um, in mind, what I typically think of in, on the prescriptive front is that there are cases in which um, sort of given certain underlying facts, I feel like this might have, this might have uh, helpful implications for, for how people choose to act or how the legal system chooses to, to regulate or govern. So for example, I had these I had this research on liquidated damages that said people are more willing to breach in the event that there were and that there um, is a liquidated damages clause in the contract. One of the sort of prescriptive implications of that work is that if you know what kind of deal you want to have, this should help. In, this research should help and should be informative as to whether you want to include a liquidated damages clause in your contract or not. Right? If you prefer to keep things relatively informal relatively sort of trust-based, perhaps, as between you and your contractor. Maybe don't start iterating things that look like penalties in your contract, right? Because it's going to turn something into calculations that are more sort of strictly um, financial or, or um, commercial. Whereas, if you want to signal to the other party that you view this deal as just a commercial transaction, a liquidated damages clause might be a way of doing that and of protecting your relationship in the event of a breach ex, right, ex post. Um, on the boilerplate side, um, so some of this work is, is, is a solo author and some of this work is with uh, my co-author David Hoffman who's worked with me on, on other papers as I've mentioned. And so one of our uh, sort of particular concerns is on the ways that um, firms might be able to leverage people's understanding of their deals, um, particularly sort of when they understand themselves to be a part of a deal, might be able to leverage that, um, that moment um, in order to decrease the probability of exit in ways that are not obvious to, to the consumers um, at the time of contracting. Um, so for example, um, Let's imagine that you could structure a particular transaction, say a credit card contract, to have the, um, the signing of the deal come before you actually get all the terms. So you don't, you know, the contract doesn't start until you have all the terms and you actually can, you can, all, you can just get out at that point. But if people feel like the deal has already been sealed, they may be less likely to then carefully read the terms and, and exit if they, um, if they want to. So that's the kind of sort of prescriptive implication, you know, sort of a, a disfavoring of terms that follow or of ma modifications to contracts that come in, that, that come um, in, you know, bill stuffers, et cetera. Well, yes, that would be uh, most likely a welcome shift. So uh, Professor Tess Wilkinson Ryan, thanks so much uh, for joining us and for offering your insights on the moral psychology of uh, contract formation. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time here on Case in Point.